welcome to this second day of the Summer School of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. My name is Nick Fahey. Uh, I'm a senior researcher at the University of Oxford, but also, and more importantly for today's purposes, I'm an expert advisor at the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, and I've had the pleasure of being one of the organisers of this year's Summer School. For Today, we're focusing on a specific topic of information from information technology. Uh, this builds on the overview which we uh, took yesterday to the overall challenges of digital health and uh, specifically digital health during the time of the pandemic. Um, and if you weren't there yesterday, well, where were you? It was an excellent session and you really missed out on uh, well, I can't say a very good overview because I gave it, but an acceptable overview and some really interesting country examples. And if you did miss out and you would like to see more about that overview, it's already up on the observatory's YouTube channel for uh, this summer school. But then today and on Wednesday and Thursday, we're diving deeper into some of the specific topics around uh, the challenge of digital health. And uh, I'm delighted, I'm obviously delighted to welcome you, but I'm really delighted to welcome our speakers for this afternoon because we are going to have uh, four excellent presentations. Uh, the standing director of the summer school, Professor Ryan Harbusa, will be, uh, I'll be introducing in more detail in a moment, will be giving us our keynote presentation um, from today. And then I will introduce our outstanding speakers for each of the more specific topics as we go through the course of the afternoon. Um, we can use uh, Twitter and feel free to use Twitter to tweet about the summer school as you're, as you're going through. Um, feel free also, and I can see that some people already how, um, feel free to use the chat. Uh, so if you have questions, for example, for our speakers, questions of clarification or points that you would like to make in response to uh, their presentations, please do feel free to use the chat to do that. Um, and uh, my colleagues, Dimitra Pantelli and Florian Tiller will be acting as moderators for the chat. And I'll be going to them after each of the presentations to pick up on any questions of clarification. And then we'll also be drawing on your comments and your insights as participants as we feed into the panel discussion that we will have. So our format this afternoon will be uh, an overall introductory presentation, then our three specific topic presentations, and then we'll have a very short break if we have time, just to allow you to stretch your legs to uh, ensure that you can grab a cup of coffee or whatever else. Um, and then we will have our uh, fascinating panel discussion and close. So without further ado, let me turn to introduce Reinhardt um, and the keynote presentation. Uh, professor Dr. Reinhard Busser is Professor and Department Head for Healthcare Management at the Technical University of Berlin. Um, he's uh, one of the observatory's uh, heads of research policy, head of the Berlin hub of the observatory, uh, a regular consultant for the World Health Organization, the European Commission, the OECD, in short, this is somebody who is a pivotal figure uh, in the scholarship of health policy and health systems in Europe. Reinhardt, you've also led this summer school um, for many years now. It's probably best if I don't, for both of us, if I don't talk about how many years that is. Um, but, and I know that today's topic of information from information systems is something of, of interest uh, to you and in particular, the framework for uh, data in this area and where it comes from and how we best use it. I'm really looking forward to your presentation and Reinhard, over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nick. Well, welcome everybody. And yes, I mean, clearly today's topic is even broader than I can cover in my introductory remarks here. And I've, um, lengthen the title slightly to make it better understandable hopefully what i'll be talking about so it's framework and country experience structuring and using big electronic or digital health data for clinical as well as health services research and policy 
and I should stress, even though, as you will so soon see that I talk about research and what we get out of data, we are in the observatory quite clear that research is not for research purposes primarily, but to do better policies, both clinical decisions and health policy decisions. And I will focus on big data. This is why I, why I added this, which are typically only available electronically because they are so big that you cannot make use of them. Uh, other, otherwise, even they would overburden us by collecting it. And I'm looking forward then to the more in-depth presentations following my um, introductory remarks. I said, this is, let's take the, the, the research uh, pair of glasses here. And in theory, we, we, we would say research is easy. And I mean, there are two big types of, of research, the one more regarding to epidemiology. So we take a population, call it population A here, and then we look at at certain factors like age, income, to determine whether people get it, get it, get the outcome C, for example, a, a disease. In our COVID times, that that I mean became very visible. These questions, you know, how is it within the population that you get more or less COVID? Is it? But and we soon found out age is a very important determinant but then clearly so is the socioeconomic status income and 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 so on the other type of research and many researchers outside public health often think of the of the second type of research so we have patients with a disease x could be covid in in our case and we test intervention y be it be a new drug clearly it could also be an in in, in immunization and we look at outcome Z, for example, death. So we want to determine whether our, our intervention Y is successful in avoiding death in these patients. In practice, everybody involved in research would say it's much more complicated. So for example, patients with the disease X, everybody would say you need to risk adjust. And risk adjust are usually the, the big three is demography, so age and, and sex, severity of the, of the disease and comorbidity. But coming from public health, you would also say, yeah, but wait a minute, why do you only adjust for these big three? What about the economic status or the income of the population? or the ethnicity of the population, or the deprivation of the neighborhood where the patient lives. Then intervention Y, usually in clinical studies, we only see a vaccine, a drug, a certain surgical intervention or an imaging device is, is tested. And people would say, you yeah, are a control group, yes or no, but even within the intervention group, coming from health services research, you would say, yeah, but wait a minute, is it, is it, does it, doesn't it make a difference whether the intervention is delivered by a nurse or by a physician? Doesn't it, it, it matter whether the physician has low or high experience, both in terms of years he or she's doing it, as well as current patient numbers? Doesn't it make us make a difference? And we know that from stroke unit interventions, which basically are only a package of well-tested in interventions for stroke patients, that you combine them. So, so does it? Can we really say the the inter, the the innovation, the intervention in isolation, is not something different than if it is done together with other interventions? And so we have a whole series of factors which we need to take into account. And I think it's useful to think of these factors. And many of these factors are inside the individuals. And in this project, which we at TU together, we're now with the observatory are doing, we said, okay, to understand what kind of data we have, we need to first look at the individual level data. We have social demographic economic data, people's date of birth, gender, education, insurance status, income, household size like this. 
So these are independent from, from healthcare. Then we have the healthcare data here in, in, in green. So this is our utilization data by sector, ambulatory care visits, hospitalizations, and, and so on. And we can, and these are these P's here, we can, if, if, we, if we not only collect them on the individual level, but we give, we also use the provider ID. For example, we can then also go from up to down basically and look at provider one here, for example, how which patients he has seen. And then we have a step further in blue here, we have the actual health data. So we have the laboratory data, we have the clinical data, including weight, blood pressure, and so on. We have diagnoses. And I've already said there that, that the electronic patient records, which we'll be hopefully hearing more about, would connect the yellow and the, and the green one. And if it is an advanced um, patient record, like a health record, it would also have, have the, the blue data. But then we have the non-individual level data and non-individual is meant not only as a collection of all the people in one living in one in one area hood. So more than the aggregate data, but these are data in which are only make sense of the population or area uh, system uh, level. So social demographic data that we have the age structure. Is this a neighborhood where we have a high percentage of elderly people, population density, percentage of uninsured, percentage of unemployed, GDP, and so on. We can have health data, the life expectancy in, in the area, how many people smoke in the area, how many people are chronically ill. We have health care data, the density of, of hospitals, the density of, uh, of physicians, of nurses, of physiotherapists in the various, in the various sectors. And last but not least, often forgotten, forgotten in health research, are uh, other data, environment data, as we say here. For example, climate, uh, but also we could have traffic data. So the availability of, of, of road transport, of public transportation, um, and, and so on. From an epidemiological public health view, all these factors would be there. If you're a health service person, you would maybe not think of the environment data. If you're coming from clinical medicine, typically you only think of the individual level data, but we need to see all these types of data and how they inform uh, research and policy. And we have, we have, others before us have looked at data source. So OECD already a few years ago has looked at the availability of digital electronic uh, health data and it looked both at the availability so what types of data are available in a country which can be connected and used for research but also at the level of actual use for research for policy making. And you see here in green with an H stands for high. These are the countries uh, where, where there's high availability or high use. M is medium and L is low. And this varies here <clears throat> in the assessment of the OECD. Like when you look at Sweden, there's high availability, high usage, or the Netherlands, medium availability, medium usage, and all kinds of in-betweens. Look at South Korea, high availability of, of data, but actually low, currently relatively low usage. Then we said, okay, we wanna understand how the data in these countries inform research and policy making and and we 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 then said okay we 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 look not only at the ranking of the of, of the country to look at best practice but also we said okay what is in, in, interesting and uh, i cannot go through all the countries here but we said you know we want to look at various types of data collection, for example, that existing databases are put like into a big meta database, while other countries only in, in inverted commas, connect existing databases. 
OECD went a step further and said, okay, looking at all these countries and you find the list of OECD countries which participated in this in these, uh, study and there are certain countries which did not participate. For example, when you look at the missing country countries, you see France or Germany as two obvious missing ones because they didn't decide to give OECD money for this purpose. And then OECD said, okay, if we start with routinely available data, how many of these, which percentage of key national health data sets are available uh, electronically? And you see it varies somewhere between 100% in Norway and Turkey to 36% in Spain. And they said, okay, but how many of these data are so representative that they contain more than 80% of the population? And this is the case in especially the Scandinavian countries that 90% of the existing healthcare data sets contain at least data from 80% of the population. Then how many of these data sets um, are, extract the data automatically so you can can really have bigger bigger types of, of numbers you see there in the uk countries it's 100 percent mainly in finland it's only 40 percent which countries use an unique patient identifier which clearly makes linkage and usage of data across data sets much more easy in certain UK countries, Scotland, Wales, that is the case, Finland, Iceland, but in other countries, it's zero. Then let's move further here. So how many of these data sets of available data sets, which already differ as we have seen, are actually used for measuring the quality or the performance of the of the health of of the health system and how many are, are regularly linked and made available for research for research purposes and we see that differs greatly there are countries like japan where even existing electronic databases are not made available for researchers while in other countries it's in the higher percentage numbers and clearly before we talk about adding new data from patient, patient electronic health records, we should also think what is available. And this is where this is where our study set in and said, okay, if we in an ideal world to answer all the questions which we could answer given the, the framework, we would add data not only from health, but from population base, from income, education, housing data, and so on. This is an example here from New, New Zealand. They have the so-called integrated data uh, in infrastructure where data are collected from all sources. And then depending on the researcher's request, clearly you have to request which data you want to be uh, have linked, you get a linked data set to answer your particular research questions. And just to give you an example on the health data, these are only the health data sets, which are inside this integrated data infrastructure. You see here they have the, from the school health, uh, preschool health check, cancer, chronic diseases, vaccination, cause of death, uh, billing data for outpatients, for hospitals, even private hospitals, all this is there in the, in the available uh, data infrastructure. We looked at, at other countries where things like that ex exist and saw Canada's SDLE, Scotland's Idris Spine, Maybe we look at the middle picture here. This is similarly org organized like in, uh, like in New Zealand, except that it is somewhat more health uh, focused, but you see all the various databases which go into the, into, into the spine, while Australia's uh, PHRN net network is decentralized and, and there are different data holders, but you can request that then the various data sets are uh, connected for the purposes of the, of, of, of the researchers. And we have, and also very 
very interesting example. We have uh, the uh, from 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 England here the uh, CPR the CPRD uh, date data link, and that is similar to the uh, IDI in New Zealand, except that it is more focused. So it is it, it basically works that the primary care general practitioners participating in this project that they can request that the data they collect is linked to hospital episode data, to death registrations, to cancer data, mental health data, but also to certain non-individual data like deprivation in index, urban rural classification. So these are data which go beyond the, 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 the individual. And in the COVID crisis, the existence of such a linked uh, database and research environment was and I think in many other countries, we envy the, the UK researchers for this was also the basis that something like the so-called open safely platform could be set up in, in, the U, in, in the UK. And it combines the existing CPRD data, but adds the COVID data almost without any uh, time delay. And uh, this is from one of their latest uh, pu publications here, where you can, can see they were able to, to say, okay, what are the risk factors for COVID, which determine COVID-related deaths more or less than deaths from other causes? If you would not have an, a linked uh, database environment like they have, you could not answer that. For example, here, smoking status for covid is 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 not an is not an issue for other mortality people are uh, much are much more uh, it's much more relevant for other causes of death while certain types of eth ethnicity south asian black other are more determining death from from covid cancer is clearly is is a relevant cause for non covid deaths but not for covid deaths so this shows this gives us a huge amount of information by combining different data sets. In the TU Observatory project, and we make these available, we made these little um, framework descriptions of what countries with their various data sources are doing. So this one is from Canada here, and then the SDLE environments we, we 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 describe which data are, are in there we characterize them based on the framework so is it is it the social demographic in, in yellow here is it the health data in blue is it the health care data is it the environment data here they combine everything how are the data collected how are the data linkage done where's the data storage who owns the data and how can you actually access them for for research purposes the book mentioned here is not yet available, but will be coming, uh, will be coming soon. And just to give you an example from what you can do when you link clinical data and mortality data with with uh, other area data, you can do things like this. And this is one of the things where you where they really this one looks at COVID mortality and uses area area. And, and individual data, for example, area-based ethnocultural composition. Does it? How much does it explain of COVID death? Income. Clearly, we know that from other countries that that low income is 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 a factor for explaining COVID mortality. But in Germany, actually, we don't have good data. I envy my can Canadian colleagues here. Urban rural, at least in Canada, in rural areas, COVID mortality was not an issue. Or here also very interesting because they have household living data that you could determine whether living in a single detached house versus a flat or an apartment uh, makes, makes a difference. Clearly, in most countries which do not have a unique person identification link, we think we cannot do that. 
because you need something like 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 that. But actually, the best research example, some of the best ones from Canada, from the UK, from New Zealand, they don't use a unique patient identifier all, all along. There are other approaches partly deterministic where you can link different IDs, partly probabilistic. So you don't actually know whether they, you are 100% sure, but you match it due to prob probability a 99 year old living in a rural area and you match these, uh, these, these, these data. And we need such an infrastructure. And this already brings me to the end of my introductory remarks. I mean, we, I hope within these few minutes I could be a, I was able to show you that electronically or digitally collected and stored health data that they form the basis of both good clinical and health services research, which is necessary to inform evidence based clinical and health policy decision that the linkage across different health databases containing information both about individuals that this is thousandfold better if you can combine it with non-individual data on areas, on populations, and even on non-health data to improve findings beyond what is possible in small-scale studies. I mean, no clinical study, however well-designed, would ever be able to show us these data. And they are really good examples to learn from. And I'm interested myself in hearing from some of these case studies which we have selected. Thank you. Thank you, Reinhardt. Thank you very much indeed. I think you've really illustrated, um, yeah, not just the utility and the breadth of data which it's useful to have and why it's useful to have it, but also something that comes across to me very clearly from what you've said is, you know, we, we think that we live in this incredible world where everybody knows everything and all data is shared and Google has access to every possible piece of information that anyone could ever want. But we don't. When we look at the picture that you've painted, it's a, it's a big variety between systems and, and big limitations actually in, in being able to gather and process and, and access the data that we want, which I, I find very interesting. Um, Florian, are there any... Um, Particular questions from the chat that uh, for clarification of, from Reinhardt's talk. I confess I didn't see any, but, but um, did, did you spot anything on the way through? Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Professor Busse, for the presentation. Um, I didn't spot any questions for clarifications yet either. So um, I guess most people are saving them for the discussion later on. I'm sure they are. Um, and uh, it, that's also testimony to a very clear presentation, Reinhardt. Thank you very much indeed. And it really sets the scene for the wider discussion. So um, thank you both. And we will save the sort of these broad, the discussion of these broader challenges that you've raised um, for our panel discussion. Now what I would like to do, because you, your talk has illustrated, I think, um, the sort of the challenges of, of information and data. And we, we use this expression, big data, a lot. Um, and you know, what do we mean by big data? And uh, one definition is that it's data which uh, has the three Vs of volume, velocity, and variety of data. Um, and one of the, the other things that this big data means is, is big partnerships, big systems, the challenges that this data represents. And I think that our, um, our three speakers now that we're going to turn to are going to illustrate both the, the range of the challenges, but also the types of solutions which there are available. And as Reinhardt said at the end of his talk, there are good examples, and we're going to hear about um, uh, we're going to hear about some of them. So first, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Kristin Braw from the University of uh, Oslo. Professor Braw is head of uh, the Department of Informatics at the University of Oslo and also heads the District Health Information Software Project, which has been developed as free and open source, uh, as, as a free and open source resource, I think, for um, it to be used around the world. Um, this is an example that we came across, Kristen, in, in developing the uh, a forthcoming observatory policy brief on digital health and the challenges and opportunities of digital health. I confess I hadn't come across it, 
And I thought that it really deserved to be better known because I, to be honest, I found it rather inspiring and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. So this is slightly different from the previous uh, presentation because I'm, we are not talking about data and big data for research, but uh, data for uh, better decisions and to strengthen the health information systems for the global south, we would say. And I will talk about the example of DHS2 for COVID surveillance, local innovation and global response. And this is part of the HIST program that uh, you mentioned, um, Nick. Uh, the, the HIST program and the work with the DHS2 has been started already in 1994 as a post-apartheid project <laughs> long time ago, says. Uh, and it was started as um, um, project action research and it's still an action research network and a program where we actually do both do uh, implementation of real systems while we are learning and reporting and sharing on these implementations so today these are becoming a global um, uh, network but also um, a, we call it a digital public global good for that are used now in more than 70 countries in the global south, now also in Norway for the for COVID surveillance. But as I said, started uh, in South Africa and I traveled through uh, geography and technology. No time for going into details of that journey. But today it's an open source utilizing all the, the digital uh, technology that is possible at hand from, uh, from cloud-based, mobile internet, whatever we have, Android, web-based and so forth. So the slogan was from the very beginning, uh, information for action, to make the data information to, to be information and to be actionable, meaning it needs to be um, also uh, be able to take decisions on a lower level, not only on a national level. So today it's a generic and generative platform uh, supporting a wide, wide use of, of, um, of use cases, also beyond the health sector, but we'll not go into that. We also have a collaborative center for uh, health information system strengthening and we are financed by all i would say <laughs> global health agencies uh, in a partnership in a definitely in a partnership so today it actually the global footprint of the hs2 today this open source uh, global available um, technology platform is used by uh, 2.4 billion people and how do we count this we count the population where the DHS2 is used as a national system, national scale system for all health programs. So it's generic. But the most important is actually that this is our individual systems for each, uh, each country and the, it's locally ownership and it's locally owned and the, the competence and the capacity is in the country. So how has this been possible? It's been possible because from 1994, it has been um, action research, meaning building capacity through local innovation, local partnership, uh, collaborating with the Ministry of Health, using participatory design, which is called the Scandinavian traditional information systems design. And very important again, this is not systems for us to drag the data out to do research, but to build capacity inside the country, to build a capacity in the institutions and building health information system for the nation and for the government. So we have a PhD school, so over 65, nearly 70 now, a PhD has graduated through this program. And these are today um, either working in, at the local university or uh, in the HIST group. We have 15 HIST groups all over the globe, in the global south, and they are mostly headed by people with a PhD from us. And we have 25 active PhD students. We have seven various international master programs through the globe. And we also have um, uh, uh, active master students here. So what we do is actually to, to do local innovation, uh, for instance, uh, for the COVID-19, uh, when you have a new use case, and then you uh, solve the problem on the ground, I will come back to the Sri Lankan case, and then you pull it through the participatory action research, research engine, and you have equally emphasis on the capacity strengthening as the platform and the software development. So this is a collaboration uh, with between in the partnership with the 15 HIST groups, together with, um, with all the um, people that are supporting that the Global Fund, UNICEF, Gavi, 
uh, PEPFAR and so forth, uh, and so forth. Gates also is part of this. And together with WHO, we have been working on um, implementing WHO standards for best practices on content and configurations for the last six years within the HIV, the TB, malaria, mother and child health and so forth, and, and immunization. That was pre-pandemic. And then it's uh, financed through uh, the D Global Fund, CDC um, and, uh, and uh, UNICEF. So this collaboration existed already. And these are the examples how we can download these pre-configured um, uh, metadata packages that then can, so the WHO in a way, use it us as a dissemination um, motor for all the 70 countries. So uh, when the pandemic hit the world, uh, already in 2020, before WHO um, declared it as a pandemic, um, Sri Lanka, his Sri Lanka, was in collaborating with the, with the ministry in Sri Lanka, and you know, with I, uh, Ireland living from tourists. Uh, 27, they got them, of January 2020, they got the two first cases, suspected case, cases coming into the airport. And then the work, they worked only for a couple of days with an app or portal entry app for contact tracing and tracing uh, these tourists through the journey. And long, long, long story short, from port of entry, they do quarantine center monitoring, ICU bed tracking, uh, community response and hospital uh, uh, monitoring. So this laid the ground for the whole HISP network, consisting of these 15 HISP groups, 70 countries, to be able to support today. 39 countries are now using uh, reusing their capacity, reusing their software already they know uh, inside the country to do contact tracing, but also now it's 27 of them also using it for vaccines. So this is a story of how this kind of community of uh, worldwide community has been able to, uh, and when we presented for the CDC, the, yeah, you know, CDC, I guess, the, the, the US government uh, um, um, public health department, as the first digital response on the pandemic. And of course, I mean, it is also the my, widely most used. So these are the packages for the data um, health data toolkit, which is published on the WHO Center. It's case-based surveillance and laboratory connected to the laboratory real, real time, port of entry screening and following up contact tracing. Very, very important, important we know in order to, to, to handling them the, the, the pandemic and the outbreak and the outbreak line listing. And today, of course, um, also uh, vaccines. So when working on the vaccines, again, we worked on with all the countries on the established partnership we already have because people are 28 of over had been use, using DHS2 for uh, immunizing children and measles and other campaigns. We using this in the collaboration with the Gavi and then working on the vaccine and certificate um, certification of, uh, of vaccinated uh, in order to be able to open up country. And we also, of course, uh, um, link to the global repositories for adverse events uh, in the Uppsala um, Monitoring Center. So we would say that this community from 1994 uh, as an academic network, uh, building on research, but action research, um, building capacity in countries. So we are leaving places, we are, we are training people in the countries. So these his groups are having responsibility of their region and they are sharing all them. So when we say open source, you're not only doing open source of the software, you open source on all the curriculum, all the training, all the knowledge, all the innovations, because there is a lot of innovations that need to be done. I mean, we have learned that uh, everyone from the pandemic that the use case is evolving, the knowledge is evolving. So you need to do new uh, uh, innovations all the time. But we started already post uh, during Ebola in the collaboration with the CDC and learn how we could be able to do uh, uh, transforming this platform uh, to become a, a disease surveillance um, platform. And all the partners have been re <laughs> configuring the investments and finding new investments like the new collaborative agreement five years with the CDC. So this has made us um, able to respond uh, fast in order to be able to build capacity in the country and put up 
um, institutions or, or systems in order to be able to do contract tracing uh, vaccination in the countries. So this example, this, uh, this uh, picture I, I was screened in the beginning, this is an example from the Uganda, where his Uganda, landlocked uh, Uganda, uh, a lot of uh, truck drivers were then stuck at the border because they were not able to get in before they were waiting for testing and test results. Where is, uh, and there, uh, these um, goods are uh, important for the whole of East Africa. So very fast, they were able to do an app linking real time to the laboratory so they could actually print certificates and because it was very dangerous to stand in these queues. So they were then doing the travel pass printing. And that was start. And this innovation of Uganda was shared in the whole network. So this local innovation was then shared in the, in the rest of the uh, network with all these 70 countries. And another example here is from Rwanda where actually the vaccination um, information center for vaccine resources and also with the printing of this pass. I can see that the picture is coming and the video is on, so my time is up, I guess. So this is um, uh, just an example, just not an example, it's actually a community and a movement that involved many, many hundred people and more people are to come. And my, my, um, my last um, um, sentence would be to, make the emphasis on building capacity locally and local ownership in order to be able for people, for ministries, government, to um, innovate and um, maintain and uh, manage their own data in order to be able to uh, have um, actionable data, meaning the more uh, data used, the better quality the data. And we are talking about how this then become routine data. So we are talking about routine data and post uh, pandemic, post COVID, there will be more <laughs> outbreaks. And of course this become a routine surveillance system. Thank you. Kristen, thank you so much. That's, uh, as I said, it's not just fascinating and very interesting. It's also rather inspiring. Um, and I'm I'm struck so I'm struck by the role of researchers in this. So you talked about the action the action research approach because, I mean I can say this as a researcher. We do tend sometimes to think that research is something separate from action, and you do the research and then someone else does the action. But that's not the approach that you took at all, is it? No, definitely. Actually, that's why we are different. So we are super different, uh, and we are not normal in Norway either, because we are we are doing both the, the global what the universe is also responsible for all the global resources. But we also um, 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 in the middle of the partnership because it's a lot of finance in order to be able to finance a, a global digital public good, and then we collaborate with all the fifteen his groups. So we are kind of a, a we are colleagues, we are, we, and during the pandemic, we have had all these digital tools and we already had that. That's why we have been able to share so fast because we were already digital. And mm -hmm. then uh, of course, then these global resources could be then configured to fit exactly the local use case in each country. And we know the pandemic uh, looks pretty similar. It's very similar uh, mm -hmm. uh, use case from, I mean, this is a really a global, pandemic and we need contract tracing all countries in vaccinations and all and registers and stuff so and together with them um, a WHO so we see that the role of the researchers is actually the researchers are implementers I so want to talk more about that but um I'm not going to abuse the chair's privilege I one thing I so I'm going to warn you now Kristen something I would like to come back to in our discussion that map of yours is so impressive uh, it's you know countries across the global south and Norway, but I sort of it occurs to me like why aren't there more countries in the global north making use of this resource? And I sort of I and I and I would be quite interested to come back to your own discussions about that. But I suspect we'll have some insights from our, our other panelists as well on that. Um, before we move on though, Florian, do we have any questions for clarification that we should bring in from the chat to Kristen? Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Christian, for this excellent presentation. Uh, very insightful already. Um, actually, there's one question that I would like to ask right away from, from my privileged position as moderating the chat, and then there also has been a question in the chat, and the two questions are somewhat related as well. So maybe I go with mine first. 
Um, Christian, when you talk about the people who are being trained to use DHIS2 and those who are actually working with it, those who are implementing it, I'm wondering who are those people? So is it primarily researchers, uh, as the title says, or are there other professional groups who are involved with this, healthcare workers, epidemiologists, um, public administrators, or some others that I probably didn't think of. So maybe if you could elaborate a little bit, bit on this, this, this could be quite helpful. And then the thing that, that Fred was asking was, um, are there data in different countries that are using DHIS2 models that are being collected centrally and then used for cross-country research? And I think you've elaborated elaborate a little bit on that. And if there is, uh, who exactly is doing this? So uh, again, boiling down to the question, who are the people involved really? I am going to ask you to be brief, Kristen, and then we'll-, and then we'll... I will. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could just say that for the last question, um, normally uh, the systems are owned by the ministries and we are just hands off. We are, we are, yeah. But we have regional, we have um, Vaho and we have the East African uh, community they have regional um, repositories in order to uh, cross-check and also the Mekong malaria belt through uh, borders uh, monitoring malaria. So yes, but then, then, then it's a regional body and it's another instance that the national systems are giving data to because all is, everything is owned by the ministries because this is a routine. This is a health information system strengthening. To the first, your question, Florian, um, who are trained? So the, the UIO, the HIST network, we do training of, of um, people that do implementation in countries. So all these academies, I didn't have time to mention, but we have regional academies in the whole world many, many times a year. Um, then we train the people that configure the systems in the country. So the training of trainers in a way and, in, uh, and it's Global Fund and UNICEF and others that do actually finance the training inside the country, but we are training the people that are training the people. And they're all ministry people, or we can have others chipping in, UNICEF, PSI, others, that, or USAID, but they're more financiers um, uh, to, to the training. So that's done locally, and we are training the trainers or, or the locals, uh, the, the groups. Mm that's responsible. Yeah. Thank you so much for clarifications. Thank you for the presentation and thank you, Florian, for bringing in your, those questions. Um, I like your style. Just take, take the floor and bring your own questions in as well. That's awesome. Um, but I'm going to move on now from maybe that low income context uh, to a much more high income context. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Matthias Belinda from uh, Deloitte, Belgium. Uh, he's a senior consultant in the uh, risk analytics team at Deloitte. It's very nice to have you here with us, Matthias. Thank you very uh, much for having me. <laughs> uh, and you deal with some of the, the sort of all the stuff that we, the fun stuff that we talk about, the data analytics and the machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so, and you're also going to talk in your presentation about an, an interesting institutional context, uh, which is the context of Belgium. And so, Although we're maybe moving from that low income context to a high income context, that, that doesn't necessarily make it easier, uh, is, is, is my impression. So uh, over to you, Matthias, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so I hope you can see my screen now also. Yep, we see your screen, great. Okay, perfect. So indeed, uh, I will talk about a bit less globally. It will be a very small example of a very small country in uh, in the world, it's Belgium, but uh, it's not because it's small that it's uh, it doesn't have its own issues. Um, and I will come to that in a, in a second, but more general first. So I'm indeed, uh, uh, I work at, uh, at Deloitte uh, and this presentation is a bit on behalf of uh, the federal um, health uh, ministers and the, well, the federal government and also Deloitte and which uh, will come clear, which is the, the relation a bit uh, between them. So it's about the, the Belgian control tower dashboard system that was built in order to monitor the vaccination campaign. So that's the, the main main topic here. Um, so just to have a quick overview, what I will talk is, I will mean, keep it very brief, of course, just first of all, why did we need such a national dashboard for this specific uh, use case? Then, of course, the stakeholders involved. So uh, as you will see, there's a lot more than, than just the, the logos on the top. Um, there's really a lot, lot of people involved in this in this um, use case. Then, of course, the functionalities. What does this dashboard do? Why did it help us uh, in, in doing this uh, campaign? 
Uh, and finally, and more importantly, let's say, what is the delivered value that it gave to the policymakers within Belgium, uh, monitoring the campaign and, of course, readjusting uh, where necessary. Finally, uh, a few maybe lessons learned, uh, which will also be framed in, a, in the bigger perspective that was already touched upon by, by the previous uh, speakers. So first up is the need for the centralized control tower. So there were, let's say, four main pillars that were on top. So we start maybe at the top left. One important part was to visualize these campaign observables. So we had a vaccination campaign starting in Belgium, um, February, March, let's say, um, in, in, let's say, at proper speed. And of course, the vaccination campaign, there have a lot of observables, key observables, like vaccination rates, um, vaccination delivery, vaccine deliveries, etc., that need to be monitored in order to, to follow up on, on the progress of this campaign. Now, going to the right, of course, there's a huge variety of input data, and this was already touched upon by the previous speakers as well. I mean, you have data from public institutions, from, from logistical partners, from a whole wide range of, of players. Um, and of course, for, I mean, a general tool would be very handy here that combines all this data, acts kind of as a data repository, where then this dashboard can be built on top, providing a data baseline. Then the next part, which was more my task in this whole thing, is then the analysis. Of course, if you have this data baseline, which combines all the data sources from all the different players uh, in this in this field, of course, easier to do than much more detailed analysis, more on uh, very small geographical um, analysis, for example, or specific age categories or whatever, uh, is of course much easier if all data is already centralized in a specific tool where you can just extract and export what is necessary and then run the analysis uh, regarding. And then finally, and I think that's a, a bit uh, regarding the, the comment about Belgium, uh, that of course in Belgium we have a, a complex uh, political system, very complex if I might say, uh, and it's of course very important that such a centralized tool that should be for Belgium in its in its whole, uh, aligns all the different stakeholders, which of course have their own uh, priorities, their own interests, and it's very of course. Uh, I mean, it's it's essential that this data baseline is so that everybody uses the same data, the same uh, to put the conclusions uh, that is that are relevant for their cases. And it's of course very interesting that of course, misinterpretations of data, etc., um, are of course an important issue if you do not do this. So let's say that's the four um, main pillars uh, that have, let's say started. Then the final uh, thing, which was the national control tower dashboard, specifically for the vaccination campaign in Belgium, and I will go over the functionalities uh, in, a, in a second. So what are the stakeholders involved now here? Well, I made a, a very small, a short stakeholder map. So it starts, of course, federal government, the federal agency of medicine is there, federal public health service, the regional authorities, which in Belgium are also important. So we have Flanders, for example, uh, the Walloon region, Brussels, uh, the German speaking region, etc. You have also the COVID-19 task force were involved. Um, these are logistical partners. You have external contractors like us, vaccination centers, uh, hospitals, uh, etc., which are all involved in some specific way with this uh, vaccination campaign, of course, all providing either data, services, whatever. So it was, of course, a huge uh, task to, to align all of these different stakeholders. here. So just to go over then the, the functionalities, the control tower itself. Um, so what is the goal? Well, the goal was that you can provide a, a user interface to regional authorities, to federal authorities, to any user uh, that is interested that shows these key performance indicators of uh, the vaccination campaign within Belgium, but also offer them the possibility to apply some basic filters, which in, in uh, the Belgian case were, of course, mainly geographical regional filters, uh, but also vaccine type filters, etc. just that you can get the uh, key observables that you are interested in uh, personally. So what is first? We have a quota dashboard, for example. So these are just snips from, from the actual thing uh, that you can get online. Um, and this is a quota dashboard where you can see uh, for a specific region, specific vaccine type, uh, and where what is the quota that is, uh, let's say, allowed for this specific region, what is the orders that this specific region has entered, the deliveries, and also the vaccine shots that they have already administered to the public. So these graphs are, of course, very useful to see if these quota are upheld, if deliveries are indeed coming in, if vaccine shots are also following deliveries, um, and there are no gaps uh, uh, appearing there. So this is mainly, I mean, a dashboard which is mainly used to spot any operational issues, uh, region-dependent, time-dependent, uh, etc. The next part is the vaccination dash dashboard. So this is really what, of course, policymakers also uh, would like to to address also to the to the rest of the public. Is of course the numbers that uh, the vaccination vaccination rates dependent on. Um, 
the specific well on the on the age group for example uh, geog uh, geography based or maybe for flanders or for a specific uh, municipality in flanders etc so you get the absolute numbers that can be used in official communication etc so this is a, of course a very important one for for the outreach then a more technical one where you do analysis then reported versus expected stock for all the vaccination centers all the hospitals where the majority of the vaccinations shots were administered to see if indeed there are no vaccines going missing if, if everything adds up from what is coming into the specific hospital or vaccination center also gets either is in stock or either is, is uh, administered at some specific time so it'd be to be able to follow up on this uh, that was for the, the stock dashboard and then finally you also have a dashboard very specific for all the different deliveries so the logistical partner gives you the deliveries of all the different vaccines from a certain source to a certain target and this allows you to really check in detail uh, for example like i said before this um expects expected versus um a reported stock that you can see indeed how many deliveries this specific vaccination center got are they indeed uh, reporting correctly because of course the reporting was essential to follow up on all the other observables so i think these are the main the main parts uh, here these are the main topics of the um, the control tower itself and then at the end what do you get from a deliverable this is the main screen that you see when you start a control tower dashboard you have some kind of a waterfall structure on top of it so what you can see then is from start from manufacturing of the vaccine to administration of the vaccine you can see at which point in time does it belong where so that's a bit the waterfall structure that is on top of this entire dashboard just to see absolute numbers again and to compare so that's a bit the functionalities. Uh, what is the delivered value to the policymakers here, which is of course the most essential? Did it give some added value uh, on top of something else? Well, that's of course what you want to know. Um, and that's in a few points. So first one is to provide that common data baseline. I, like I said, we have a complex uh, political structure in Belgium. That it's very important that when comparisons happen, that they are based on data that is already validated and that is coming from a centralized source. That's where this control tower is, of course, very useful. It provided a common data baseline where everybody can put their conclusions on. Uh, but also, for example, uh, every week there were updates in a standardized data format, standardized infographics that were just updated from the week before from the control tower data that were then used by policymakers to assess the progress of the vaccination campaign so this this common data baseline for all alignment of stakeholders let's say that was really a, a strong uh, added value uh, but of course just tracking these observables was of course also one uh, just to be able to say uh, by the, the click of a button okay what are the percentages we're dealing with now are these according and that's important of course according to the plans that we put forward uh, in the beginning of the vaccination campaign and can we follow up why these are problems for example then three is then more detailed analysis like i said that's where my point was mainly uh, coming from is that uh, for example we did analysis on geographically level that's the map you can see on the right uh, what is the comorbidity and uh, let's say 65 plus age group vaccination rates uh, and are these is this homogeneously spread across belgium or are there for example geographical areas municipalities or whatever where for some reason uh, there are i mean the, these vaccination rates were lower than expected and should we assess this problem uh, and, and why, why is this problem occurring so that was of course a very important task as well providing that you have this control tower giving you the centralized data which is then very easy to export uh, and, and very easy to then handle uh, for, for further analysis, of course, creates so much more uh, efficiency and so much more effectiveness in this analysis. And then finally, which was then the main point is that this control tower dashboard is also used, of course, to spot these operational. Uh, this, it's, let's say a conclusion of the three top is that there were many times that we spotted something in this control tower dashboard that said, okay, but this is uh, this is strange. Why is this? Is this data quality related? Okay, then we have to report back to those uh, reporting the data. Is this maybe operational related? Okay, so let's see how we can uh, we can handle this. So I will. I see the uh, Nick's face appearing. So I will uh, address the lessons learned as a conclusion. Then that's nice, uh, nicely timed. So I think what we learned, and that's more mainly from a from a technical standpoint, is that in a crisis situation, of course, uh, when the vaccinates the vaccines started to be available, it's of course very quickly to. I mean, a crisis situation is very natural to react quickly and, and to start delivering uh, results very quickly but what we spent at the end most time with is all the regions had their own system running uh, for the, to register vaccines etc and, and these kind of things and it would be that's the main time consuming part would be to integrate those systems into the centralized system so if you would start in the beginning um 
with, with already kind of a data supervisor, somebody or some institution that is responsible for data quality, for data completeness, data, et cetera. This was, of course, would have been such a time saver towards the future. Uh, so I think that's a, a main point, which I summarized here, uh, so that we have one stakeholder that would be already initially uh, appointed and that is controlling of, of these uh, these issues. And then finally, I think as uh, we have a federal uh, health service um, in, in Belgium, which has a strong IT service. And I think this was the, uh, really essential for this entire uh, tool because it was very quickly built uh, and easily uh, adaptable, easy changeable as well. Uh, of course, following uh, things that we learned during the campaign. Uh, so I think this is one uh, essential point because it happened in incredibly fast. Um, and that's of course what you need in these kind of situations. So I think this is the end. Um, so of course, if there are any questions, please uh, please let me know. Matthias, thank you very much indeed. That was a, a, a very clear presentation delivered precisely on time. Thank you very much. Um, there, are those, there are those consultancy skills that are already, already being finally honed. Um, Florian, uh, I don't think we had any specific questions for clarification. Um, I'm going to assume not, because I didn't. Uh, so, Florian, did we, did we? Did I miss anything, or were we okay for clarification questions? As always, Nick, you didn't miss anything. There was just um, nicely shared uh, an example of how um, data is being presented and and delivered to the public in Iceland, but no, no clarification question or anything. Perfect. Thank you, um, Matthias. I'm going to give you fair warning though, because uh, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to explain the governance structures of Belgium because. That frankly is a task that has defeated many people down the years. Um, but what yeah, there is an obvious question which comes out from your presentation, which is if there is this very strong central IT capacity within the ministry, why was it Deloitte? Like, yeah, why 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 did it need to have this broader partnership? And that's not a critical question. It's just I think one of the things that comes out from all of our discussions today is about the need to have different stakeholders and to understand different value that's added by different people. And I think I, I quite like to come back to that. So I'm just giving you warning about that for when we uh, when we come to our panel discussion, if that's okay. Yep. No problem, no problem. All right. Thank you. But then in order to make sure that everybody gets enough time for their presentations, and in particular you, Carolina, I don't want you to be, because you were the last person, I don't want you to be short of time. I want to turn straight away um, to uh, Carolina Matskevich. Um, who is Innovation Director at the European Connected Health Alliance. Um, and you're actually, I mean, just to pick up, make a link as it were to yesterday, your topic about secondary use of data and how we can make better use of these different data, this picks up exactly on one of the issues that we talked about yesterday, where we were, um, we had the pleasure of having uh, Professor Silvio Brusafero, who runs the Italian National Institute for Health, um, who was talking about the Italian response, and it was fascinating, and they did amazing things. But this challenge of how to make use of secondary use of data was the single thing I think that was one of his greatest frustrations and difficulties. So it's so appropriate that you're talking about this. Please, over to you. So for, thank you, Nick, for the introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here with you. I recognize some of the all the new friends among the uh, participants. Um, and yes, uh, I'm Karolina Matskevich. I work for the European Connected Health Alliance and I'm bringing here a bit of maybe general perspective of actually how to engage people, how to encourage people, citizens or patients into sharing their data to actually complement this whole ecosystem of, of data. I work for the uh, ECH Alliance, but I'm also associated with my data uh, global and I have one slide on uh, on, on my data uh, approach. I will, I will share this with, with you at the very end. Uh, but just to start maybe this, this story, why it matters, why it matters to actually encourage people to share their data and what's the value of, of uh, regular people data for health and well-being. Um, what you see on this slide is a bit of historical um, uh, data from the, from the Europe Barometer and the European um, Commission public consultation. But we don't expect that the, there's uh, some massive changes to the people's um, 
attitudes to 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 the to how they uh, perceive uh, sharing their data. So uh, six years ago, still before the scandal with um, uh, U.S. election and with uh, different data breaches. 81% of the people said that they don't feel they have complete control over their data and they would like to give explicit approval before collection and processing of, of the data. Then we learned that people generally would like to manage their own health data and also that most of the people believe that the, their data have the value for improving treatment, diagnosis, prevention of diseases. And I will speak here on the um, experience that uh, we got at the European Connected Health Alliance from the project called Digital Health Europe, which is the um, cooperation and support action for the European uh, Commission, where we led the task on the citizens control data governance. And in general, we were, we were doing the study to present the recommendation and guidelines on the citizen control data governance models and data sharing campaigns for health. So we did the desk review, interviews with the experts, but what I would like to share with you is also the large survey, five simple questions on the um, data sharing, data control and sharing and that was responded by the almost 1000 people from all around the EU. And what is important here is a common citizen. So not an expert, not a health or um, public health expert. Uh, they're the regular citizen uh, who yeah, were, was asked about like, uh, do you know who has access and control to your data? Do you think that your health data might be of interest for research? with which organizations you would be willing to share the data. And to make the long story short, of course, you can assume that there was the differences, some small differences in geography. There were some small differences in age and the socioeconomic status of the people. But the very important message that comes from the survey, uh, which I think is also not a big surprise to you, is that people want to know what, uh, what is happening with their data. And people are generally like eager to share their data. And more <laughs> this eagerness is uh, like, people would like to share data or are, are um, willing to share their data with the public organization more than with the private service providers. And this is probably something that has to do with the with the trust of how the data is being used, how the data is being stored, and that the data is not also uh, then without people's um, uh, knowledge. And based on this whole big study that I now explained in, in three slides, uh, we uh, delivered some recommendations on the general and practical level. And on the general level, we generally should make sure we as the health community, data community, health care providers, public or private, we should make sure that uh, people know who uses their data and for what purpose. This has to do with transparency, uh, transparency accountability, clarity. And also provide citizens with the mechanism to control the use of their data. So this, is, this has more to do with the, with the technology uh, on the other side, the, we should invest in the digital health literacy. So to really, and not only of the people, but also of the healthcare professionals. Then we should explore, promote person-centric models and solutions for data sharing. Well, person-centric, citizen-centric, human-centric, generally those models that put the person in the center. And also what is very interesting, perhaps we should develop a new European wide or global digital contract, a contract that actually um, somehow organizes the, our relations in the uh, online, online space that is very clear, very transparent, and we know which behaviors are ethical and which are out of uh, question. And then on the practical level, um, there was also um, like, to, to establish, the, uh, well, there was a lot of uh, uh, emphasis put that uh, perhaps we needed the independent regulatory and monitoring body on the European level, introduce the gradually of data sharing in the consent mechanism. So perhaps that you agree to share 
all the data with those service providers or authorities, but only this, like for, for, for this particular data, you would prefer uh, not, to, not to share it with, with so widely. And then very important system of incentives for people who share their data. And one important thing I didn't mention when I was speaking about the results of the survey, people would like to have an incentive to share their data, but it doesn't have to be monetary. Actually, the monetary in incentives didn't, uh, were not that popular. Um, but people would like to do, get something, even feedback on how their data was being used or that it helped in particular research or the better, uh, better service, for example, or some um, advice on, on, I don't know, health uh, behaviors. And then, of course, I, I couldn't, uh, uh, it's, it's not possible to speak about the data sharing or citizen centric data sharing without touching currently on the European health data spaces. So for those of you who are new to the, to the topic European health data space, this is uh, um, one of the data spaces uh, that are written in the European um, data strategy and um, well, it's currently being built. And then during the Digital Health Europe project, there was also some consultations with citizens on the number of different uh, workshops on like, and here what you see on the slide, do you currently use data for this? So you see manage health condition, track state, view tailored medical information, and would you like to be able to do this in the future? And you see that generally like, many for in in many of those areas people uh, imagine that they would like to be able to do this in the future like for example manage health condition be involved in improving uh, your care connect with other patients so for all for all this of course we need some infrastructures and models for data sharing to allow people to be active participants in this European health data space and here also on this slide you see like use of data in the European health data space and you see here individual level health data so the data coming from the citizens or patients and uh, population level health data so all this coming from the registries um, big health data and we see that actually the individual level health data has like huge importance it can be used for health status monitoring continuity of care care pathway tracking and so on and so forth so we really should do our best to collect this data um, to make sure that of course it's uh, we, we collect the data according to the certain standards that we ensure that the quality of data uh, is, is good and ensured. And we have, of course, also the channels to fill this data to the um, healthcare practitioners, uh, to, the, um, to the decision makers in general, to the, to the system. Um, and maybe to, to, to wrap this up a bit uh, shortly. So there are, of course, uh, some areas to, to invest, to investigate and to invest further. Um, and on the level of the improved citizen awareness, we definitely should improve citizen trust, awareness, literacy, and access to their data, and provide models and tools that allow control on data use. Then on the, uh, on the maybe uh, bringing all this to the, to the practice, we should of course invest in the large scale testing, explore different citizen-centered models and collect results, and of course, analyze impact and sustainability. And we need more and better data. I think this is a mantra we all in the health and, and data uh, ecosystems will repeat, more and better data. So of course, this relates to the interoperability and standardization. And let me, Nick, only to uh, sum up with or touch on the, on the my data. And here you might think, okay, so um, how can we actually solve all those issues of sustainability, uh, interoperability and, and uh, standardization? And I would like to just um, make you aware or, or bring this to the discussion, this concept of my data. This is the, the vision of the first sustainable prosperous digital society where the people have control on their data, as you see in the logo. 
And you might also know my data as my data global organization. This is the organization registered in Finland, but working globally to popularize this concept. And generally just to, again, um, in one sentence, my data is for uh, like people having control over their data and people getting value from their data and then organizations, public, private, no matter what, uh, you, that for the organizations, the ethical use of data, ethical choice is a, is a good choice. And my data combines business, legal, tech, and societal perspective. So this is something also that was mentioned about the different uh, partnerships and of course, cross-sectoral uh, cooperation on this topic. Thank you so much. Carolina, thank you very much indeed. Um, You've addressed exactly the sort of the set of issues that um, I, was, I was hoping that you, you would address them. Thank you. Um, we are, oh, do you know what? I was just about to say, there aren't any questions um, from the chat. And one just literally came in from um, uh, Anita. So uh, are the results of the survey available online that you, uh, that you mentioned? Uh, yes, of course, they are available online. Please also look in the Digital Health Europe EU and in the publications and there is the whole document on, on with those recommendations and the, the results of the survey and if you cannot find us then please contact me on carolina at uh, echalliance.com. Perfect. Um, now for, I actually do have other questions that I want to ask you but we're going to have a whole panel discussion so I'm going to come back to you after that. So um, we have through no fault other than the fact that um, uh, these talks have all been really, really interesting. We are just a little bit behind time. So what I'm going to suggest is we are still going to have a break, but it's only going to be a five minute break, everyone. So we're going to have a five minute break now. Um, and I'd like you to suggest that you that obviously you're welcome to use this for whatever you want. You probably want a comfort break, grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea or whatever it is that you would like to have. Um, uh, and uh, the other thing that I think you might like to do in the coffee break is this chat's been a bit quiet. Uh, now we come to the panel discussion. So when we come back uh, in just uh, four or five minutes from now, um, perhaps in the meantime, if you can think about different questions, you might like to put them into the uh, into the chat box and we'll we'll take as many as we can in the panel discussion. Um, in the meantime, then, I'm just going to thank um, those three speakers again. Um, I hope you'll all stay with us. Just take a quick break now for a couple of minutes, um, and then we will be back afterwards for what promises to be a very interesting panel discussion. Just a two or three minute break, please, colleagues. Hello. So uh, let's restart. So um, what I'm going to do is invite all of the speakers to re rejoin me. This is where I would invite you all onto the panel, as it were. So I, I, you know, let's let's see if we can bring everybody back. Um, there we go. So um, so what I want you to do, speaker, I want you to imagine that you are on a beautiful island in the Venetian Lagoon, where we would normally be, Reinhard, we, we wouldn't have Prosecco yet by this time of the afternoon, would we? But there would be, we'd know that there was some waiting, right? Yeah, it's a... That would be the major incentive. And I would also yawn some, for some Aperol spritz in the cafeteria or on the terrace. So, so, this is the spirit which I want you to have, all right? So we're in a relaxed setting, we're on a beautiful island in the Venetian Lagoon, and we're gonna have a, a wonderful open panel discussion. And we have some really interesting questions actually. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kick off with a, a sort of a general point and invite your, your comments on it because uh, the title of our session was about information from information technology. And we, that one of the things that comes across really clearly, I think, from all your presentations is there is enormous potential. So you've demonstrated all in different ways just how much potential there is for this inform for information to be collected and to really add value when we do that. 
And we have really good examples and we have them in high income settings and we have them in low income settings and we have them very much driven by different sectors. We have some of them that involve patients and citizens, if not all, Carolina. Um, so why is it still so hard? Because Reinhardt and I might come to you first. You, you had that slide in your presentation about um, from the OECD, admittedly, where, where it was uh, you, all these countries and there were a depressingly large number of them that had high availability of data, but then low use of data. You know, like it's like, why is it so hard to put in place these information systems and what might we do about it? Well, I think that, well, the first thing is, I mean, you start with the, with the halfway down. I think that it was also the message that, I mean, that given the data which are collected, I mean, even, I mean, they started from, from the available, from, from databases which are collected. So most countries, some, somebody collects data on hospitalizations and, 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 and so on. And I mean, there are even some countries where this is not even done electronically, let alone linked to other uh, health sectors. And the next thing is, is this done electronically? Are the data automatically put in, 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 into databases? And then are they linked? Even the healthcare data uh, are not often not linked. Somebody has the hospitalization data, somebody has the pharmaceutical data. So they are not, they are not linked. And, 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 and in parallel, we have the question, why isn't nobody demanding the, the, the linkage to actually do, do research? And so we clearly have a long way to go. And, and, and if you, comp from my point of view today showed that, I mean, we had two complementary things. What I said is that we have actually in, in information which we need to link both within healthcare and across healthcare. And then if all countries had this, then we would still have, let's say the, the immunization data, but also the entry control data for COVID. We would have seen immediately the additional need for, for data, but they could be linked and we could get better information. And that was what I showed, I think from Canada and, 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 and England. I mean, I'm also envious of my, of my colleagues in the UK that they, that they, they have these, that they, that they have these, these data. I'm not saying, you know, I don't want to necessarily, the next step then from the observatory is clearly whether you make the right policies based on the, on the good, on the good research, but there's so much, to go we, we, but there's so much we, which we have to tackle systematically. And then I would, I would say, you know, what I hear from patient reported data, what Carolina had spoken about, we, we should first see what is available and then where are the niches where we don't have the routine data, where is actually the need that patients add add their additional add their additional data. Otherwise, if we don't do the basics first, see what is available, make that linked, we might duplicate work again. And I think we should also be a bit cautious about that. You make a really important point also about linkage. So one, it's not just data as data, it's well, the power of that data is enormously added to when you can link different sorts and types and combinations of data. And that brings us again to this question of big data, right? So being able to link different sources and types and have them in an integrated system. Kristen, you, um, I, I did want you to ask, to ask you about this. So one of the You've spent so much time with this project, with this and, uh, and this too, are building these really impressive systems that are almost wholly unused in the global north. And I'm still kind of frustrated about that. Um, what's your kind of takeaway of as to how, how does this work? How does this, what are the conditions for success for being able to actually put these kinds of systems in place and address these challenges which Reinhardt has identified of, you know, not just individual systems, but actually pooling them together in systems where you can link data. If I could address first, why is, why is it only these global south that are using these systems? Um, and I think um, I can talk for Norway because we, uh, I mean, because we are heavily funded by the Norwegian aid agency in, in Norway. 
as a flagship and everything. And the ministries of development has chased the Ministry of Health in Norway. Why is Norway not using DHS2? It's open source, it's free, it's a lot of capacity, a lot of potential and functionalities. And then actually it's all it's also about that um, at least Norway, but within EU actually, you are not able to use uh, open source because you need to have a bidding process and you need to have some partners that can earn money on this bidding process. And who I, we have talked to Accenture, why Accenture? Why don't you learn this and you can be rich and you can do this as a business? Okay, so because of them, EU the regulation for bidding processes, that's one of the big hurdles to use open source in the global north. So that is so. That's one, one, uh, one answer to that one. And then, of course, in the global south, it's also a big, big problem of data use. Because you need to have it institutionalized. You need to have, um, because uh, no, usually the data is going up to report to, 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 the, to, the, to the national repository, not uh, drizzling down. Uh, as actionable. And in DHS2, you can actually sit in, in the national level and monitor the maternal death in a district to see which villages are contributing to this maternal death, and then you can take action there. However, in order to be using the data where the data is originated, you need to have uh, internet, <laughs> bandwidth, uh, uh, training. So this we have started a big project now on the data use to actually investigate in how can we overcome the hurdles of the data use, not only on the national level, but on district and below, because th that's where the, 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 the decision needs to be made uh, in order to impact the, the, the quality of services. So yeah, that's a big challenge because there is no, that's not institutionalized. So, but we are working hard on it. That's actually part of our research that we do field studies to, to study why and where and how to support the data use. And how can we innovate to make that easy and accessible data? And, and so linking to uh, Carolina's presentation about the value for patients, you know, the value for citizens, I, I guess my, I'm putting words in your mouth, Kristen, so tell me if I misunderstand. But, part of the idea behind ensuring that local data use is that people really see the value of the contribution that they're making to the overall information system is that is that fair but but um, we are talking about routine systems for health workers yeah uh, so, so so the so the use will be then for the decision makers within the health or the health workers within the clinic however we have many countries uh, kenya tanzania have uh, uh, and Rwanda have um, public accessible uh, dashboards so the, so the citizens can watch the quality of services. Yeah. Yeah, but not their own data. Yeah, yeah, no, understood. Thank you, Christian. That's, um, and your first point on procurement is, is just profoundly depressing. Um, and, and frustrating. And, and Matthias, I mean, you, know, you're, you are here from one of the major consultancies and, and frankly, there's a business opportunity for you right there. The observatory will insist on a very small percentage as a result of it, of it being mentioned during our summer school that I'm sure Kristen as well. Um, but I, it does bring me to this whole capacity point because I, I said I wanted to ask you about. So here you are in Belgium in this yeah, it's a, it's a country with a lot of capacity. I mean, I know we, we, we slightly joke about the, the governance structures and the rest of it, but this is a very capable country with some very strong institutions. So what were the challenges from your point of view in, in trying to achieve that kind of pooling and, and the construction of this central data platform um, that, that you described in the form of the, of the control tower? Why, why, why did it take so much sort of you know, help and support to make that happen? 
Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a it's a very good question. So for me, I mean, mainly I was was involved in the in the analytics part, but I can speak for my colleagues. I think that the main point there, and related also to to the points raised already by the others, is uh, is stakeholder management. That was a very big one in in where we assisted, and because that's that's a bit related with this linkage between data. So all data sources were available. The capacity to link these data sources and to to create this control tower was also available. But it is making I think the different stakeholders aware that there is something beyond their own data set. I mean, that if you can link this to another data set, if you can create something which is usable by also other means, I think this is where you find the true gold of data, of course. And that's that's where I think in the beginning, I mean, there were, for example, uh, no unique identifiers for hospitals. Hospitals. There were no lists, for example, for uh, how many people are now actually working as in healthcare. Uh, these, these kind of, of, of parts and then also linking the different sets together, they were just not existing. Um, and just because they were not looking outside of their own area of expertise. And I think that's a, a general comment that, that was made. And that's also where why the stakeholder management was one of the major things that I think our, uh, my company uh, assisted in is, is to make these linkages appear and, and just to make people realize, ah, but wait, we can help in this respect because we have this and this data. I think this is, uh, I mean, not only applicable to, to this specific situation, but in many, many more. If you would sometimes look outside your area of expertise with your data that you have, you can see how much more you can, uh, you can do with it. Thank you, Matthias. And I think, I mean, yeah, I think it's a very general point, isn't it? Which is that sometimes you need people from outside your own setting Yep. to show you the value and the potential of what you already have in some instances. Yep. And, and Carolina, I was, I was very struck by the results of, uh, one of the results in particular of your, of your survey, which was um, around the degree of comfort that um, different citizens have in relation to public and private sharing. Because let's be really blunt about this. We have... Uh, in, in the form of Kristen, we have a, a real sort of, um, this is, as, as you've described, a global health good, I think is the phrase, Kristen, that you use on the, um, for, for the DIS2 um, infrastructure and, and, and the action that you're undertaking. We also know that there are private sector actors, and, and I'm, not, you know, I'm not picking on Matthias in particular, but we know that in this sector, a huge amount of the innovation and of the development in just, for example, the systems and the analytics and the use of data involves private sector partners it involves tech companies it involves you know analytics and skills that we don't necessarily have in the public sector how do we square this with with the very clear difference in trust that we see from citizens you know it's also like the when, when i think now about the, the the results of this of the survey it's also one thing is the declaration the other thing is the behavior on one hand the people when asked like you know with whom would you like to share your health data and they say well i would rather prefer to share it with the public service providers not with the private then at the same time we all know like about Google, right? This is the, the biggest, like if we think now when, when I'm like connecting different dots, when I'm thinking now about the issue of interoperability or why certain things are not possible in the public sector and why they are possible in, uh, in the public sector. And, you know, here we have Google and, and people sharing their data and interoperability is possible and you have the full picture. And of course, like maybe this is not ethical, but they somehow nailed it, right? So it's also, um, so one thing is like how people are also sharing their data with the private companies and not being aware of what is really happening with their data and how it's actually this incentive is something that plays a key role. We share the data with Google or we don't have any problem with sharing their data or we don't even think that there is a problem because we get the incentive and the incentive is better service you know like whatever you need you get instantly and we don't often get it from the public service provider you don't really know what is happening with your data or you have different theories about you know how the government is like monitoring you and then surveilling you know using this for the so for the surveillance so i think that there is a lot of different small little issues related to, to, to people's behavior and declaration about like who they trust. But I think that the, 
if I think about what is the key element, is the incentive. Thank you. And maybe I still would like to comment on the on the issue of the stakeholders. I think this is also coming back all over. And there was also a comment from one of the participants about the stakeholder management. And now when I'm also thinking about it, it's I think like many, many issues that we are pointing out today is something very common for other public health problems. So cross-sectoral cooperation, stakeholder management, making the healthy choice or ethical choice an easy choice. So I think we really should use, you know, um, the learnings from the from the other aspects, what we already like, you know, managed uh, in, in, in public health and then bring them to this uh, discussion about the, the use of data. And also when I was learning about the Estonian experience with their health platform. So what they did is was like in 2004, when the e-health uh, strategy for in the EU was, was um, implemented, um, the Estonians were the only country that actually like, took it very seriously and they, they started working from the, from the day zero and from the day zero they actually established the cross-sectoral committee on, on working on this health platform and well um, we all now learn from, from this and, and we are always very jealous uh, about, about their experience so perhaps this is also another element of success. I, I, I cannot resist using that opportunity to do a final little bit of marketing for our YouTube, the, the recording of yesterday's session for anyone who wasn't there, because we had a presentation of the Estonian strategy um, and some of the key building blocks and their approach and, and precisely how that long term commitment that they took and the multi stakeholder commitment that they took put them in. I, I think a position when then dealing with a, a digital health response to the COVID pandemic that most countries would envy, frankly. Um, and that's uh, also, I think, in terms of trust in institutions, which is a very important issue that we might come back to. Dimi, I, um, you are you know, I, I, it's coming to you now because you know we divided this up, and you are you are the, the sort of the, the keeper <laughs> of the questions from the chat for this session. Um, are there any other particular questions which participants have raised which you would like to, to highlight now for us to consider in the panel? Thank you, Nick, and, and hi uh, to everyone also from me, from the observatory headquarters in Brussels. We have a number of questions and a number of inputs. I think they mirror uh, what we've heard so far in terms of how complicated it is, the availability of data and the complications of different data at different levels and bringing it all together and interoperability and uh, actually using it and lack of trust. And I think what we, what we could maybe um, see as a red thread, go, thread going through all the questions is this, okay, so how can we ensure, A, that the data is uh, good, that it actually tells us what we need to know. So this is the other V um, that one of our colleagues is pointing out, veracity of big data. Um, so how can we ensure that the data is good? Uh, how can we ensure um, that we motivate uh, citizens to actually share their data? I think Caroline already touched upon this a little bit. So this issue of trust in the data, in the people, in the regulation. Um, and so the, this fostering of trust and how it fits into moving forward with these ideas, I think um, might be the next step to take in the discussion, seeing as we're also in the, in the final uh, 15 minutes of you know, tangible solutions based on the speaker's experience uh, and what we've talked about so far about moving forward. Take it back to you. Thank you, Dimi. You, you, um, you, you shaped it very, very nicely. So how do we build that trust? Uh, I'm gonna put a slight spin on that, which is between the different actors, um, both public and private, and given the different institutional settings. Reinhardt, I, you, 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 picked on the UK in terms of, you know, uh, for, for one thing is data infrastructure, the other thing is then the policy choices that get made. Um, but the but it does affect the trust that people have in the institutions if they're not confident about the kind of choices that are being made um, on the basis of the data. So I'm, I'm going to invite, I'm going to see if any of the panelists in particular would like to uh, start without sort of necessarily going in the speaker order, either on these topics or on the general issues of, of how we ensure trust and how we ensure that 
this whole challenge of both gathering and pooling and then making better use of information for health, how do we improve on where we are? How do we actually make this more? But, of a but I mean, isn't it often, it's not even the trust or it's not only the trust of the population, it's also the skepticism of the politicians themselves. I mean, many politicians don't want transparent policies. And, and, and I think it's not, maybe not even primarily the population, which doesn't, we, we talked about this yesterday as well, when we said, I mean, when, we, when, we, when we look at population surveys and they are supporting the better usage of their, of, of their data to improve health and, and, and health care. But I think, and when I, I mean, when I look at my country, I mean, do the, do the hospitals really want that you see exactly how much overutilization they do? No. They, they, of course not. I mean, and do the physicians act, act really want what that, that we can pinpoint to the fact that one or the, that physicians in one area are over prescribing compared to, to, to another area? No, they are not interested in this, that, that this becomes known. So I think we, we should, I mean, and, and, and we know that healthcare in various in all countries is full of 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 lobby groups and and whether the hospitals are public or private is not often not not even the thing so i know from my other courses that public private has different connotations different meaning from country to country but i mean often we we collect the data, whether they are public or private anyway in one database, but they have all have the same ideas then that if you link it, then you could see, I don't know, ambulatory surgery, that, that outside hospitals, you could do it not only cheaper, but with better health outcomes. If you link it to patient reported outcome data, then God leave alone. I mean, they, they don't want that. So I think we really need to form a pressure group also as people involved as us in the health system really say transparency first I, I, yeah i think you you may you put your finger on a, a sensitive point but a really important point right Hunt? because um yeah so there's a, a colleague of mine here at oxford in the same department um ben goldacre who uh some people might have um come across around uh has a thing called the data lab um where he's doing exactly this, gathering data, which is which highlights variations in performance and what is, and what is happening, um, and it, it yeah, I, it's it's amazing. It can be so powerful information, data. This kind of comparison can be so powerful, um, and that's precisely why people are also sometimes quite careful about it. So Carolina Reinhardt is, is calling for a group of people and for, you know, we should have some kind of a platform advocating for use of data. Do, can you think of a platform like that at all? Well, <laughs> like on the on the level of the organization, the organization oh, I was kind of thinking of your group, yeah, actually, that they yeah. mentioned about, of course, uh, the My Data Global is, is uh, really advocating for this. But I will mention here actually the 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 point and and as I as I said, like um, believing that the ethical choice should be the easy choice, the right choice. And, and, uh, and as I also mentioned, we know that the, from the technological point of view, the sharing of the data, the interoperability of the data um, under the conditions of the safety and security, that's possible. And so, of course, we, we, we stay with the question, so why we're not doing this in the, in the public sphere? And I think that the fragmentation of those uh, actions and also like what Kristen mentioned, this uh, public procurement issues are, are, are a bit like barriers on that. Um, maybe still coming back to the trust issue, there was also a very, very uh, good comment in the, in the chat that it's like, how you can build the trust in data sharing if in some countries or in some systems, people are actually punished for sharing their data. You might uh, be willing to share your health data, but then your insurer will come and say, ah, oh, okay, you have the, you know, some um, conditions. And so you will, you will get the higher price for your health insurance, or you might be willing to share your location data during the, the COVID pandemic, but then maybe you will be like sent to the uh, quarantine and, and lose your income. 
So of course, this is like something that we really have to solve on the on the higher level. And, and I didn't mention this in the introduction, but I, I come from Poland and I live in Finland and Finland is well famous for uh, the, the high trust of people in the in the institution and then on the other extreme there is my my native country so what I can this is like I don't know scientific guess is like also what Reinhardt mentioned the behavior of the politician the general climate of like how you um do you empower people to actually you know to, how do you how do you empower your citizens to be your partner in in this uh, in this discussion and i think that this is also very important to to treat people um you know as 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 partners or someone who is bringing this value to the system and and actually create the conditions for them to to enable them to share this data and 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 participate in in creating this healthcare system to, together and you mentioned in, in one of your um, responses in the chat, you were saying that there are technological solutions here as well that, that, that help make this processing of data sharing and data pooling in, um, easier. And for example, again, another colleague here is using a platform um, for what he calls dynamic consent. So where it's consent that you know, it isn't a question of you, you make a decision once and then you're stuck with the consequences for the rest of your life, but you have control and you can at a certain point say, yes, I'm willing to share, have my data in. And then at another point say, actually, no, I'm no longer willing and your data has to come out. So do you think that there are, maybe we're missing some technological developments as well about, about how we can, we can help to facilitate data sharing? I think that the technological solutions are there or are emerging and there is also something called like for example my data operators or there are so-called data wallets where you actually can you know data banks so those those things are are coming um, what I also responded to the to the comment from Joseph actually is like that the the key challenge now, what I, what I see from, for example, the, the discussion about the data operators or data intermediaries, or they're written in the European data, uh, data uh, strategy and the data spaces, is uh, the, the business model. So still, you know, it's, it's difficult as it's maybe, you know, we as people, we need incentive to, 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 to share their data. Of course, the companies or those service providers actually also need some incentives to, to, to provide those services. And now the most common business model um, is selling the data <laughs> for, the, uh, for the marketers or, or for other services. And this is what very successful data sharing companies are using. But somehow this, this data model for the ethical companies is, is not yet uh, completely figured out or people still need to somehow be ensured that, uh, okay, for, for ethical um, data management is worth to, to pay because what is free in Google, you actually pay for this, but you don't know about that, that you, yeah. What's, what's, what's the saying? Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's on the internet, if the service is free and uh, the product is free, then you are the product um, is, the, uh, is the, in the general uh, guide. So I just wanted, um, we're coming to uh, the last few minutes, um, and I just wanted to turn in particular to, to Christian and Matthias, and, um, but then obviously not to prevent any um, last minute statements from any, from any of you, which is about uh, capacity, because it strikes me that what, what both Christian and Matthias, what both of you have been doing in different ways is from outside systems has been helping them to strengthen and build their capacity and to sort of, in a sense, complement and strengthen capacities that maybe weren't there that should have been there and i i wanted to to ask for your perspectives krista maybe um you would like to go first on what are the needs now and then the thought which i'll, I'll, I'll ask you to to consider which i'm conscious that we do you know what we haven't talked about in this whole panel discussion which is super refreshing but also really surprising we haven't mentioned the pandemic at all uh, which is incredible. So, like, is there anything? Is there a different kind of opportunity or a different perception of need now? And 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 maybe I'll I'll come for very any any very final thoughts to Carolina and and, and Reinhardt after I've, I've um, asked uh, Kristen and, and Matthias to talk about this question of strengthening the capacities and systems, Kristen. Yeah, that's what we do at the university is to strengthen capacity. And uh, I actually mentioned the pandemic quite a lot, I would say. Hmm. 
Sorry. But it hasn't uh, come through as a discussion point, was my point. But yes. Okay. So, of course, uh, the pandemic uh, building capacity during the pandemic is also a challenge because, uh, but then we also innovate on that one. I just want to mention it. That's kind of uh, to, to form WhatsApp groups that you kind of create forums that actually um, share uh, experiences because we need to build capacity on every level. If you're talking about data use, you need to, to, to make incentives and you need to build analytical capacities, but you also need to create a demand and someone to listen to your data. So that's kind of on the lower level when you can form WhatsApp groups. So we have an um, extensive experience of building capacities, but then on the other end, when we're talking about the information technology and innovation, to build ownership, I really think in order to capacitate to participate, I usually say that's my slogan, you need to have certain capacity in order to be able to participate. And then you create via the participation of forming and configuring the system to suit to your institution, <laughs> you create um, uh, participation. And that is uh, to, to capacitate that one. And you create ownership. So it's actually about, so what we do when we say action research, we build institutions. So it's all about capacity locally that are connected to a global, regional and global community. So that I think is the, the, the mass movement. So that is what we do. We create a community that share and inspire. And I really think one thing that is underestimated when it comes to capacity building is actually um, uh, to be inspired, to be inspired by others. If others can do it, we can do it. So that's kind of a so, certain kind of a transparency because you need to create both a demand, demand for capacity, and you need to be inspiring people that is possible. So I think um, uh, openness, uh, when you talk of open source, it's, uh, it's all about community, to build a community or practices uh, that kind of have any needs or any benefits from, from, from sharing, meaning you can do something good. And you, you mentioned that the digital public uh, global good is actually these kind of resources that, that kind of this pandemic have shown us how important it is to be able to have resources that you can um, uh, utilize and build into your local practice. So bringing from the global to the local. That's what we uh, work hard to accomplish. And I am, uh, I am, I, I love the addition of the word capacitate as well. I think that's a, that's a, a verb that we didn't have. We, we have now and we're going to take it from you. And I, I, so I guess my point about the pandemic was like so much of what we've been talking about here are challenges which have existed before the pandemic and still exist. I know we've all talked about solutions which responded, but the challenges seem to be similar. And I was, I guess what I was after was, is this now a moment of inspiration and motivation, which is going to change our opportunity to address these issues? Was sort of that was sort of the idea I was reaching for. Not very clearly. Um, I have one comment on the pandemic. What did you oh. learn us? The importance of health data. Period. We are we are we are sucking for data. We are reading data all the time, locally and globally. Yeah. So that's actually what I've learned us is actually the importance of having data, access to data and analytical capacity. Thank you very much. Matthias. Yeah, maybe just to quickly add there, I think, I mean, to this, this, uh, this inspiration, I think is a very important point because uh, also uh, it's, it's, of course, it's been a crisis, this pandemic. And I think the bi biggest innovations or biggest, I mean, innovation yeah it will start when there is a crisis i think and then people start to wonder yeah but we can do this and this and this to tackle the challenges from this crisis and i think like you mentioned already before the challenges already existed uh, but now it took a crisis to start really tackling the challenges head on uh, and i think also that's one of the reasons i think why for example we were also in the stakeholders management that i already mentioned is that we were necessary is because of in a crisis i mean they have too much work to do uh, to do to do only this this dashboarding or whatever uh, to to get all the data there that's too much so we have to assist them in in doing everything while if 
not being during a crisis, you would think more ahead and think more towards the future and say, okay, what do we have now concerning data, uh, databases, concerning data quality, et cetera, and how can we improve this towards the future that, I mean, people don't often get time to do this eh, because you have your daily tasks at your job, et cetera. But if, if this future vision was more allowed and incentivized also and inspired by others maybe, and they can think about what we can do with the data we have available uh, and, and do that, not just responding to a crisis, but already doing it at the, uh, today. I think that's a, that will be a very nice addition. I, I actually think um, uh, that's a really nice note to end on, actually, <laughs> as, as our kind of yeah, a, a closing message for this session. So unless either Reinhard or Carolina, you had any burning things that you really, uh, in that case, I, Matthias, I'm gonna take that as our as our closing note um, for the day. Um, I would really like to thank, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we were on an island in uh, the Venetian Lagoon, right now I'd be asking you to give a really loud round of applause, because, and I'm sure you would, because those were excellent talks, and I'm just, I'm very grateful to it. Um, to, to Reinhard, to Kristen, to Matthias, and to Carolina for uh, their contributions. I'm very grateful also to Florian and, uh, and Dimitra for helping to uh, steer and moderate the chat and to our colleagues, um, Annalisa and Simone for their work behind the scenes in making sure all of this happens efficiently and effectively. Our next session will be tomorrow at the same time, turning our focus from information to digital health change in care. Uh, it will be fascinating and interesting all over again and uh, we really look forward to uh, you joining us again tomorrow. Thank you again everyone.